Part 1 Hello, this is Compco Computer Solutions. How may I help you? Hello, my name is Farmer, William Farmer. I'm from Soft Bear Supplies. I uh, was wondering if you could give me some advice and a quote on a new IT system. I'm sure we can help you with that, Mr. Farmer. Could you tell me a bit about your company? Well, we're a manufacturing firm with about 50 staff. We make teddy bears. We're growing fast. We've just taken on 20 people, and we'll be employing another 30 people over the next six months or so. So, what's your problem? Well, with demand so huge, our current computer system just isn't up to it. Our internet connection is slow, printing never works, and our computers are so old that they keep breaking down. What exactly are your main requirements? First of all, we need a computer network which is reliable. At the moment, we're losing time, and therefore money, of course, every time a computer fails. On top of that, we've lost orders and even client addresses. How many computers do you currently have? About 20. But ideally, every employee would have one. We'd like to introduce an electronic diary and meeting system, and an automated system to track the hours people have worked. At the moment, we have someone on the reception desk, you know, writing down what time employees arrive and leave. It's embarrassing, really. Not at all. You'd be surprised how many companies come to us with similar problems. Is there anything else? Well, with our existing computer system, the problems began after it had been installed. The company we bought it from just left us high and dry. When the printer failed, they uh, repeatedly ignored our calls. And since we have no computer people here, we had all sorts of problems. So, what sort of support do you offer? Don't worry, Mr. Farmer. We consider the after-sales service we provide to our customers to be the most important part of our business. We keep our clients happy, and they stay with us for years. Hmm. To be honest, I did look up other computer companies on the net. But I called you because actually I got a recommendation from a friend of mine who works at Finron Fish. Jeff Green's his name. Oh, yes. I remember Jeff. We've just upgraded their system with the latest dual-core processors. Talking of upgrades, how long can we expect it to be before any new system is out of date? I've heard most new systems are out of date after only one year. Of course, technology moves very quickly, but the need to upgrade depends on your company's requirements. Some companies don't upgrade very often. Then they end up with the sort of problems you have. As a rule, most companies update their systems every couple of years. Can you give me any idea of costs? We prefer not to do that over the phone. What we do is send out a consultant to your company to work out what's best for you. After that, we'll be able to give you a full quote within 24 hours. That's terrific. If you can just hang on while I get my diary, I'll see when I'm free. Part 2 Every four years, the National Sports Commission does a survey on how the media cover women's sport. This year's report, released last month, shows that only 4% of newspaper stories are about women's sport. But why does women's sport get such a raw deal? Today I'm talking to Greg Hunter, the editor of Today's Sport magazine. Hi, Greg. Hello, Amanda. You know, people in the media don't see a difference between men and women's sport. In other words, we don't say, oh, this is a sports story about women, so we won't publish it. Usually, if we don't publish, it's because it's a minority sport and very few people do it, or very few readers have an interest in it. It's got nothing to do with whether the sport is being played by men or women. Well, Greg, I don't know that you could really call netball, for example, a minority sport. I mean, the Netball Association estimates that every week over one million women in the UK play netball. Is that a minority sport? OK. A lot of people say that, and say that it's not fair for women that we don't write anything about netball in newspaper and magazines. But if you use that argument, then we'd be doing lots of articles about fishing and other big participation sports. As I said, it has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that it's women. It's not even about how many people play it. For us, it's about how many people want to read about it. So what's the ratio of male to female readers on your magazine? About four men for every woman, and that's up maybe 5% from two or three years ago. Why don't more women read your magazine? Do you think that a lot of women are turned off it because it is male-oriented? Oh, without a doubt, Amanda. And do you think women actually want a sports magazine aimed solely at women? Absolutely, I think, uh, for sure. If we look at the sports magazines on the market at the moment, 
they're definitely more for the male sporty person than the female sporty person. So I think, yeah, there's a gap in the market for a sports magazine aimed at women who take sports seriously and want to read about sport and learn more about sport on all levels. So in your experience, what do women want out of a sports magazine? I think women readers care more about the human side of stories. They like to know about what, what's behind a sports person. For example, top female tennis players with children find life very difficult. They have to travel all the time to international tournaments, and that means they hardly ever see them. Whenever we run an article about this kind of thing, it's very popular with our women readers. Moving away from magazines for a moment, the Sports Commission report also says that in the last four years, television coverage of women's sports has actually decreased. Women's sports received only 6% of total TV time available for sport last year, compared to 9% four years ago. Why should that be? OK, I have to admit that one of the reasons women receive little media coverage is that most sports reporting is done by men. I heard there are about 600 members of the Sports Journalist Association of Great Britain, but only around 60 are women. Perhaps if women were more involved in sports journalism, there'd be better coverage of women's sport. But anyway, there have been some improvements in how women's sports are shown on TV. Really? Yes, of course. For example, last year, the Women's Football World Cup was shown on a number of TV channels. There are more sports channels than ever now, so a lot of big women's events are getting shown. And in the future, it'll be possible to see a lot of minority sports on cable or satellite channels. So that's progress, and I feel that a little further down the line. Part 3 Douglas Finch is to be awarded the honorary degree of Doctor of Business Administration in recognition of his outstanding scientific, design and entrepreneurial achievements and their important contribution to the history and reputation of Bristol. Douglas Finch was born near Glasgow and attended Allen Glen School before reading Aeronautical Engineering at Glasgow University, from which he graduated in 1961. He gained a master's degree in industrial engineering at Cornell University, USA, in 1963, before returning to the United Kingdom and joining the Bristol Aeroplane Company. He joined the Bristol Gliding Club and in 1965 received the Silver Sea Gliding Badge. In 1967, he helped build the Bristol Bell, a red and white striped balloon which made its first flights at Weston-on-the-Green near Oxford. It was the first modern hot air balloon in Western Europe. In 1968, Doug Finch was issued with the first ever private pilot's license for hot air balloons. The success of Doug Finch in translating his ballooning expertise into a commercial concern is reflected in the birth and success of his company, Finch Balloons of Bristol, which was formed by Finch in 1971, five years after he constructed his first balloon. The new company was based in Dutton, Bristol, where a total of 29 balloons were made in the basement of the property. 1971 also saw Finch build Golden Falcon, a balloon designed specifically to fly across the Sahara. In 1972, Doug Finch received the Royal Aeronautical Club Bronze Medal, the first awarded for hot air airships. A year later, he was awarded the Royal Aeronautical Club Silver Medal for the first balloon flight over the Alps. In the same year, he received the Lighter Than Air Society, USA, Achievement Award for the development of the first hot air ship. Five years later, he attempted the first Atlantic crossing by balloon for which he received the Royal Aeronautical Club Gold Medal. In 1978, his attempt to make the premier Atlantic crossing by balloon ended when bad weather forced his heated helium balloon Zanussi down after a 2,000-mile flight from Canada. The Finch Company moved to its present site in Gellingborough in 1983, and in the following years, all of the records for distance and duration were taken by pilots flying Finch Balloons. In 1989, Finch Balloons Limited received the Queen's Award for Export, confirmation that Doug Finch had made Bristol 
the undisputed balloon manufacturing capital of the world. During the 1990s, interest in becoming the first to fly around the world by balloon became intense, and almost all the contenders have used Finch helium hot air balloons. Doug Finch has advanced the science, technology, and art of balloon flight to the highest level. His factory in Bristol is the world's largest, and last year he was awarded the Prince Philip Design Award. Doug Finch will receive his honorary degree of Doctor of Business Administration at the award ceremony at Bristol Business School.